Welcome to Sprout Lab's recording of our webinar on how to evaluate 70 2010 learning ecosystems. This isn't a recording of the live se session. What I do is do a recording after the live session. Um, our live sessions are fairly interactive. Uh, and what I've started to do with these is also give people summaries of what actually happened during the session as well. Um, I'm director, founder, and lead consultant at Sprout Labs. Um, essentially what Sprout Labs does is help organizations that have complex products and services um, design and redesign their learning programs. A lot of what we do is based on a 70-20-10 learning um, model and we generally work with sort of complex content that's in the bloom taxonomy at the higher level of, of things. Um, sometimes it's a bit hard to explain what we do because we actually do work differently to everyone else in the industry. We have different processes, we use different technologies, and this blended approach is still um, something that not everyone else does. We essentially have four areas of services we work in across strategy, designing and development, technologies and implementation. So probably the big thing is we don't just design and build courses, we also make sure by helping around implementation and um, embedding into the 70 is part of what we do as well. Uh, what we're talking about today in terms of evaluation is it deeply embedded into the strategy work we do with organizations um, around building measurements into, into programs, but also it sometimes crosses over in helping organizations measure um, and evaluate what they've done afterwards as part of the implementation of programs as well. What I'm going to be talking about is these four themes, um, essentially prototyping uh, and developing the mindset of prototyping, how that also contributes to building a culture of research and evaluation in your learning team. Um, probably we'll do some follow-up with blog posts in the near future around this as well, as well. Technologies for embedding continuous measurement in learning programs and then also a bit about um, the success cape met method as a way of evaluating 70, 20, 10 learning models. So we started the webinar with this little bit of a gauge, which people put their names on, which was really interesting because essentially most people went right down the bottom here and, and talked about the fact that they really, and that they were just evaluating um, and using surveys. It was at that same time they realized when I talked about it and, and put it at the top, a, a mature approach to evaluation. I'm not 100% sure what a mature approach looks like. It might, might actually be many different things. But one thing that was quoted at the Learning Cafe conference last week was this quote about essentially what Fortune 500 um, CEOs in the US um, wanted from HR and learning functions. And they wanted really good linkages and measurements that, that were showing the contribution of what learning and HR was doing to the um, business. But the really scary bit was that only 8% of people were doing this. Now, the thing that was also really interesting about the Learning Cafe and Conference, and it might have been because I had the filter of getting ready for this particular webinar, as I was at the unconference, was the, was the first time that I felt like in recent times around discussions in L&D that measurement, evaluation and thinking through those sorts of ideas was actually being put at the centre of conversations, especially in the earlier part of the day um, where it was talking about how to make things learner-centred and also um, fostering sort of discretionary learning and the fact that that sort of needed to be measured more. But it was just really interesting to see that shift happen as it happened as well. So I asked this question, why, what's hard about evaluating e-learning? Sorry, what's hard about evaluating learning? Now I'm just going to refer back to the notes that happened back on the whiteboard. Um, and some people came up with, with things like, it's hard to identify the metrics that matter. Um, and what really brought around the change, which is sort of, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, it's not always easy to evaluate the 70 and 20. Um, it's harder to catch the feedback and get the evidence. Uh, and then 
getting people to actually put comments and give richer responses as well. And then this whole, whole idea that so many other variables play into standard form, um, performance measures as well. And that many of it's um, subjective as well. Cool. So, in the title of this webinar, I've talked about this notion of learning ecosystems. And it's something that we've started to work with more at Sprout Labs. Um, this particular diagram is from a recent article in AITD's training magazine. And essentially, a learning ecosystem for me is giving me some freedom to be able to work with design and talk about um, programs that are beyond courses. And it really lends itself nicely to that moment of working beyond courses. Um, essentially, a learning ecosystem for, for me has to have the right knowledge basis at the bottom of it and the right knowledge supports and then guides for and goals and for how people need to be learning and what they need to be learning. These might be, um, I th literally think of them as pathways, might be competencies or capability frameworks or sets of things people need to achieve. People, and this is one of the things that people quite often forget when they move to strongly workplace learning programs, people need places to practice new skills, fail, learn, change. This, in some ways, becomes actually what formal learning is about. This becomes activity-based and becomes a place for people to practice rather than some way for people to gain knowledge and the knowledge supports gets removed from the training experience. Um, and then there needs to be ways for people to learn from each other and also with each other. Um, and the thing with this is that it means that there's multiple different parts to it. The way I think about it is that it's not a straight line of a course equals an outcome. And this is what was interesting when people were talking about and put into the whiteboard this idea that one of the challenges of evaluating e-learning, sorry, challenges of evaluating learning is this sense of you don't just do something and then something happens. So many other things contribute to the, to the problem as well. One L&D person that we work with who used to work as a soft skills trainer, as a vendor on the vendor side, said that as a vendor, he would never encourage a client to measure his performance by an evaluation because he just felt that there were so many other factors at play in the client's implementation that he couldn't control, that that was sort of an unfair thing for him to be trying to, trying to do. So I think even in traditional event-based learning programs, we still have this sense of not a one thing happens and then an outcome happens. It's, a, it's normally a series of things that actually equate to things. The thing is also, traditionally what we've been doing is we've been measuring inputs. We've been measuring learning rather than actual business metrics and outcomes. And what we need to be doing is measuring the um, outputs instead what is the results rather than what is the inputs. The one word that I find really useful for thinking through this process is the word impact. And to be constantly asking why a program is being thought about, what's the impact of it going to be, as it's going to be designed and different features are being thought about for the design as it's being built, what's the impact of this? And then the evaluation question of, well, what's the impact being? Oh, this is a really simple word, I think, to be able to keep in the back of our minds as we work to actually keep on doing a whole, is this activity going to have a real impact on the business? Now, Sprout Labs has what we call our Learning Way Working Framework, which is based on, essentially, and the process behind the Learning Way Working Framework is based on what's called design thinking. And design thinking is really a process of taking what sort of user interface product designers and graphic designers do and applying it to um, other business problems. Um, and at the core of it, there's two types of activities that are different to a lot of other processes. Developing a really rich um, understanding of your end learners um, and users quite often design thinking is called being user-centered or learner-centered. 
But then there's the, this other thing, which is really the interesting thing about the evaluation. At the, at the core of design thinking is this notion of prototyping and testing and evolving. Now, it's been really interesting showing this particular diagram to a number of um, especially instructional designers and they really wrestle with it because they sit there and say there's no implement implementation step, um, there's no uh, uh, um, evaluation step um, and it's because they're so embedded in that notion of um, adding and it being a sort of staged approach. So what happens here and startups do this extremely well they move very quickly through this prototype test evolve back to prototype and it becomes a fairly constant quick loop rather than a whole let's build something that takes us six months to build it's going to take us six months to six months to a year to run before we can get evaluation data um, and then we, we, we do a change on it we might do some continuous improvement during that but it doesn't get sort of broken down into smaller chunks or explored and really taken as a, as a data-driven approach. It's a more a process-driven driven approach. So this, and it does have some challenges for everyone, this sort of process of doing the quick and dirty prototype to get something up, up and going. And it does, does mean taking a few different risks as well. Now, the interesting thing is that some of this design thinking approach is really comes from product design. And I've got a deep, I can sit there and go, yes, I understand how to prototype an e-learning module. But prototyping a 70, 20, 10 learning model is more difficult. Especially if with the programs that have less formal learning in them, um, and are more sort of building a sort of scaffolding in infrastructure. So the, what we've been doing and what we've been applying is some techniques from an area of design thinking called um, service design, where people are thinking about essentially um, organizations, products delivered as services. One of the most powerful things that the service design area uses is stories to be able to communicate what they're doing, and then um, journey maps as well. I'll show a learning a learner journey map in a, in a moment. Um, if you listen to or been to some of our webinars, you will recognize the learner journey maps. The other thing is the next level of fidelity and complexity is role plays. These don't have to be a traditional sort of everyone role playing, they can actually be more like a walk through this happens and this happens and this happens so that people get a sense of how the bits come together. And then finally, the when something's sort of starting to be solid, um, being able to pilot it. Um, now, some of the best L&D people I've worked with um, always call the innovations um, pilots. Um, just because of the scale of organisations they work with, sometimes their pilots have 10,000 learners in them. Um, the learner stories, there's a few things we've actually really learned from using these. Um, there's a bit of feedback that we got from a stakeholder in one particular uh, blueprint around the learner story. There was a red flag that later in implementation that was particularly something the, the cohort of people really struggled with in the, in the learning model. Uh, and it was interesting because essentially we got that feedback early before the program was built. Um, and that was one of those learning experiences from that is we should have listened to the feedback around the story and actually worked with, worked with that because of the really rich process possible bit of feedback from a, a, a cohort of people. Now this is what one of these learner maps, learner journey maps looks like, essentially a visual way of representing the way things click together, um, essentially slotting things into the 17, 20 and 10 mode and then over time as well. Interesting thing for me, and it was happened when we did the next exercise in the, in the session, one of the things I wrestle with is many things actually don't so much fit into the 10 or they don't so much fit into the 20 or the 70, which is where the thinking of things as ecosystems and designing as ecosystems, you don't have this tension about having to label things as a particular type of activi activity. And I'm finding that particularly um, useful and reduces some debate during design processes as well. 
So, we are then I asked this question about how to embed um, prototyping into the mindset of L&D people. Just grab my notes. Um, some of them th thing was um, actually this building a culture of continuous improvement, um, building a culture of experimentation, and the key word around allowing people to play a little bit more. Um, and also trying to foster a collaborative approach between things and working on a mindset and it's partly about this play and experimenting that not everything has to be perfect all the time things can 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 be actually um things that are not quite right and one person added to that particular one as well that getting some of your change agents and early adopters involved in your prototyping process makes it a little bit more um, secure because sometimes those people are more open to taking risks as well. So through the webinar and through the rest of the session I'm going to weave through a little bit of a case study. So if you've been to any of our webinars or listened to any of our recordings, you've met Rebecca, she's a fictional L&D manager. Essentially her problem we're going to look at is that she's developing um, her line managers into being learning leaders and the first step for this is developing a, a, coach, a coaching program. Now during the session we workshopped what this could look like and some of the real major features of this was a thing that really stuck out in the middle of, of the whole thing and then what I thought of and talked a little bit about later was the notion of a community of practice for managers around coaching. Then also giving some people some um, ability and tend to be able to work with um, role plays and develop skills using role plays and then a set of videos as well so that people could refer to and mentoring people as well. One of the really nice things that was talked about was actually um, in, and it's sort of a nice example of something that crosses the 70 and, and 20 is direct observations of managers doing coaching sessions and then giving feedback to them so they were actually doing but they were actually getting feedback at the same time so it's a really nice example for me of something that's actually both a 70 and a, and a 20 activity so when we talk, then talked about and thought about how this could then be prototyped was a, a, a interesting thing to do because essentially what we sort of talked about was well actually one of the things that would make this a little bit easier to prototype is actually just working with a smaller cohort of people. Um, so it wasn't a big cohort of people to start with. You weren't rolling it out to the whole organisation. It was just a few people you were working with. Um, and possibly also just a, a trial of new people as well. So marketing has a similar problem to learning with this whole um, indirect effect problem. Um, and essentially, the marketing has vague statements like promote the brand of an organisation so as, as their goal. Um, and I mean, I sit there and think promotes a vague word, and then brands are one of those things that's heavily loaded. And then what's been really interesting over the last period of time, and I think there's a lot we have to learn from marketing in terms of learning as well especially how it's placed in the organisation and its importance as well. Um, the, essentially, marketing has become digital marketing and the, part of the reason for this is because digital marketing can be data-driven, it can be measured. The, normally, a activity can be linked to an outcome and that gives a very different result from marketing from having that vagueness to be able to actually have evidence of success. Now, I'm not sure if you realise, basically any site that you do any logins on or downloads from, that means that people can then do individual, an organisation can do individual, tr individual tracking of you. Um, I was talking to someone recently at a fairly small bank um, and they got to the spot where they were actually, depending on your postcode, they were serving up different types of content um, that was relevant and they'd found from their past data that particular people in particular suburbs were more interested in different types of products and services. Um, so it allows that's, that's tracking but I also think it allows for a very 
interesting, exciting set of um, personalization as well. Um, now, one of the things around the whole measurement, improvement, and continuous thing that just allows a different way of thinking is the best way to put it if you're starting to, to, to work with a data driven approach. One of my lovely examples from marketing is the process of A-B testing. And I haven't actually heard of anyone doing an A-B test in um, learning yet, but I think it could be an interesting thing to try. So in marketing, what an A-B test is, is you have two, two versions, normally with only one thing changed, and then you test that with a small group of people, and then the most successful one is then the solution that's rolled out. So a good, really good example of this is actually the um, at Sprout Labs is this last um, webinar message that went out to every to the mailing list. Two versions went out to ten percent of the um, mailing list with a slightly different um, wording and a slightly different um, subject as well. Then one definitely became a winner that more people actually opened and then the software and the digital marketing software automatically sent that out to every, everyone. So it was all, it was doing the optimization around what was working automatically. Um, and we're not seeing that sort of thing happening yet in our digital learning software or our, our thinking around being data driven yet, yet. But one of the interesting things from my point of view is the marketing data doesn't have a standard set of way of explaining actually how things work. Whereas actually in learning, we do actually have a really mature standard now about how people learn and what they're doing. And this is the um, Experience API or AK Tin Can, if you haven't heard about it. It's still early days in adoption. Um, a lot of the traditional methods haven't adopted it. And that's, I think, one of the things that's holding it back. It's two things. One, a really powerful way of explaining how learning happens. So an actor, Sally, experience the verb, um, solo, hand gliding, which is the object. And then these get all stored in, in what's called a learning record store, an LRS. Um, and the powerful thing about the uh, learning record store is multiple things can feed in from, from, from mobile apps and from your learning management system and from your intranet so that essentially it becomes a storage spot that's not just about SCORM objects but it can become a whole lot richer. I have actually seen a number of people work with it really in a really powerful way, ways with mobile apps um, and I think there's some possibilities between being able to do some data analysis by the learning people around the intranet as well to be able to figure out well, what are people struggling with. I do have an issue with it when we've used it. Um, it's at a risk that it's really collecting a lot of data, but it's still really collecting data about the learning experience, not the business outcomes. So there's a real risk to that. And you can see that being sort of addressed in some of the software. So some of the learning record stores allow business metrics to be added, and then the reporting actually allows a correlation between seeing, okay, so if we've got this many completions in this area, what's that metric doing and how that is, how, how is that being affected? Now, this is also my time to talk about a really elegant idea that I've heard a couple of times, and it was hinted in the whole, when I talked a little bit about what people were seeing as, as a challenge, it's actually sometimes the challenge is finding the business metrics. Um, so I encourage you to work with uh, the rest of your organization and whoever, does some of your reporting to try to find what business metrics are being recorded and then which ones could actually be used and linked to L&D programs. And then only try to choose one metric that you're affecting rather than sitting there going, oh, we're affecting all of these. That's where you get into that mushy spot where it becomes more complicated to measure. So the other side, the other thing that, that I'm seeing as a really interesting idea and, and way of working is um, learning logs or logs of learning. Um, essentially what they are is learners, employees doing quick sort of write-ups um, every day or every time they do an activity of what they've done, um, what they've learned and what they've done dif differently. 
essentially this increases reflection. Uh, it's possibly the best way so far I've seen of making learning visible. Um, and we've tried it in one pro program to start with. And uh, to be honest, I was a bit apprehensive. It was me who suggested it. Um, and I was still not quite sure if the learners would sit there and go, oh my God, I've got to write in this, this reflective journal thing. Um, actually, the response has been completely different. They're not writing one or two sentences. They're writing hundreds of words. They're loving it. They're feeling like it's actually giving them something that gives them evidence about what they're doing and moving forward and it's helping them track in their own mind how they're learning and how they're improving and, and gaining an understanding of the complexity of the content. Um, I've also personally started doing it in an area uh, of Sprout Labs that I'm trying to improve and found a similar sort of thing of actually articulating what I've learned really embeds it very quickly into new practice and also makes me realise where sometimes mindsets and behaviours stop my behaviour, stop me get, getting in the way of making the improvement that needs to happen. Um, some of the technologies that can be used for this, um, just a simple Word document. Um, Microsoft OneNote can be used as well. Actually, internal blocking systems could be used as well. And the other one um, is the 7020 tool from Fortier could be used for the same sort of process as well. So we did an interactive activity around what data could be collected around the um, coaching program. Some of the things that came back up are sort of impressions of before and after um, and measurements and records around conversations. Um, 360 reviews, um, also what the other, the other suggestion was is to use cultural evaluations and um, use those as a benchmark. Um, what was really nice was no one suggested that the amount of coaching sessions be the measurement, so that was really refreshing from my point of view to hear. The um, next thing I just want to talk quickly about is the success case method. And this is where a couple of people with that challenge talked about the fact that 702010 programs are these mixture of different things. And I think this is where essentially surveys cannot be used for these complicated ecosystems. And the success case method was started by Robin Brickhoff. Robert Brickhoff. It's really a method that's actually um, a case based and a, a narrative based method. Um, and it's really a way that, to capture those sorts of non-linear things and possibly some of the factors and inputs that happen below the surface and don't get picked up in business metrics or um, surveys as well. So what it is, is this sort of five-step process. Um, one, what should the impact be? Um, that impact word again, and thinking that through and then trying to find who, who has been, been the high performers and the low performers to, and using that through surveys or through business metrics. An example of this is a program um, we've been working on over the last few years where essentially was to increase the business driver was to decrease the time to compensate. So the time that people get through a program was the measurement. And that's a fairly easy one to be able to pick up, actually, who got fights through faster and who's, who's going slow. Then to interview people um, and interview those high and low performers and essentially ask the questions and look for the factors about what really has affected um, what they're doing and then analyse and look for patterns and then tell the stories. Now, the stories don't necessarily need to be the actual stories of the high or low performers. What we've found is it's actually easier to build fictional people that are possibly a combination of all the factors to sit there and say, so the high performers have these sorts of conditions happening and these sorts of things really affect and have been the things that have made the difference. And then the low performers, this is the things that are getting in, in, in their way. So you actually, at that telling that story stage, you really depersonalize it. So an example of this is when we did the, um, evalu uh, 
the evaluation of the overseas trained doctors pro program for GPs. Um, it was, we could fairly easily find out who the high performers and low performers were because essentially the high performers were the people who got through the exams and the low performers were the people who hadn't got through the exams or hadn't even sat the exams yet. Um, we did the interviews. Uh, what was fascinating is as we came through with the interviews, we saw something that we didn't actually ask any questions about in the interviews. It was about um, diagnostic diagnosis of skills and then customized coaching. And essentially everyone that was a high performer that had got through had had someone do a really good um, diagnostic with them about where their skill shortage was and to provide really targeted, focused training support and coaching around what that particular thing was and it was interesting because we had, we saw it in the first in first couple of interviews and then we kept on seeing it, it, it as well so it became a really really clear factor really quickly now this success case method does have some pros and cons and this was a, a good session to run because essentially we, we've seen it be, and especially in strongly technical environments, people react sort of, oh, I actually want the graph. I want the, I want the figures. I don't want the stories. So some of the pros and cons that we talked about were um, things like in terms of the, the cons were um, time frames. And it does take a little bit more time. Um, and managers actually not wanting to hear the stories. They just want quick numbers. So... Lots of pros for it, um, and it can get telling the stories gets the emotional side of it, um, and then really tapping into the elements for success. The other thing is that it focuses a lot really on the performance of the learner, not the facilitators, um, and also um, someone hinted that there's probably actually a process which actually helps the learners articulate what's worked for them as well. Okay, so that actually sort of brought us to the end of the, end of the session. A few people sort of talked about um, some of their takeaways that they could actually then work on further with things like um, how they could prototype better and then also apply this um, success case method as well. Um, thank you everyone for um, listening to this webinar and I hope you found it useful. If you've got any questions, um, my inf contact information is on the website or maybe an email message you sent, sent through as well.